Uh, well, I want to say something about the innovations, the uh, new elements that you find in the uh, political uh, in political theory made by the major theories, major thinkers of Austro-Marxism. I will mainly uh, concentrate on Otto Bauer and Karl Renner. I don't know whether you can see anything. If you can see it, you will see Otto Bauer, Karl Renner. Both of them were also active politicians, uh, very engaged in party politics. They were also members of government, so they are not pure theoretical uh, um, or, or scientists or theorists. Uh, Rudolf Hilferding, Max Adler also were important uh, figures in the political thought of the Austro-Marxists, but I will only focus on, on uh, mainly on Bauer, a little bit on Renner. Well, both were confronted with a challenge in the world of uh, 90, around 1900. They had, as a very young group, a, a group of young uh, Marxist scholars, to come to grips with a, a peculiar situation, the changing world of capitalism, just after the first Great Depression, which ended in 1895, and uh, in the context of a highly fragile European state system, after the decay of the Pentarchy, uh, the regime of the five great powers, in a period of intensif intensifying imperial rivalries. Uh, they were part of and lived in a moment of a rise of the socialist labor movement to an unprecedented power position uh, due to a lot of political innovations which they had triggered or the socialist movement has triggered like mass parties, trade unions on a large scale, cooperatives, new mass media, etc. Uh, they were confronted with the fragility of their homeland, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they were living in a period of unprecedented bloom of all the sciences and the rise of the social sciences, which were invented at that moment, and the rise of Marxism to the prevailing theory and worldview of the European left. Uh, there are some major innovations and achievements to be noted in the contributions of the uh, young Austro-Marxists, they were rethinking actually the development, the trajectories of statehood, the development of states within the European context, uh, which did not always lead to nation states. In fact, nation states were still rather exceptionally. They were as ardent Democrats that were rethinking the goal, the political goal, the republic, the democracy, universal suffrage, and they were all engaged in struggles also on the parliamentary stage. They were rethinking socialist politics, they were rethinking a lot of basic categories of political uh, theory, and we'll come to that in a moment. Their contribution, in my view, is at least as important, I would even say more important, than the whole of Gramsci, because they were decennia before that. Uh, and uh, they were the real pioneers of Marxist political thought, not Lenin and Trotsky. So rediscovering the Austro-Marxist is of crucial importance for breaking from the stranglehold of Leninism. Well, uh, first they rethought, they analyzed the Austrian empire. And in order to do that, they looked back at the development of states and statehood uh, within the European context, uh, in particular to try to make sense of the Austrian Hungarian uh, monarchy as a hybrid form of state, which did combine elements of the Ancien, ancien Regime, uh, a centralized bureaucratic rule, and on the other hand, elements of a modern liberal state, like the rule of law, suffrage, but very restricted, a very restricted form of parliamentarism. This Austrian state was a hybrid, and they analyzed it as that, 
This was not a real empire, lacking naval power, lacking colonies in Europe or abroad, lacking any kind of global reach, it was a regional power. It was no real nation state, but actually comprised many nationalities. So you could say it was a peculiar type of multinational state was with two dominating nationalities, the Germans and the Hungarians. So their question was what held this state together? For instance, the army, uh, the bureaucracy, the monarchy, the law system, the dominant German culture, but there were also a lot of forces driving this whole uh, uh, fragile construction apart. And so their leading uh, question was, could this state of many nationalities survive? And could it even be uh, a model, uh, uh, political form of a future non-capitalist society? In particular, Rena thought so. So uh, Austria, the Austrian-Hungarian state was a kind of multinational state and the future political forms of socialism would be like that. So it was worth their while to try to save this in one, for, uh, one way or the other. Um, as they were ardent Democrats, in particular De Bauer, uh, he was um, uh, thinking about the, oh, sorry, now I, I jumped. Oh, we'll be back in a second. Um, Uh, Bauer was, uh, in particular, Bauer uh, was fascinated by uh, the um, problem of uh, the compatibility of uh, capitalism and democracy. And he followed Marx's early thesis from the 1850s. That there is an inner contradiction in every form of political democracy. So uh, a democratic capitalism is always a fragile construction. There is on the one hand political equality, equal universal, certainly under the conditions of equal and universal suffrage, which gives potentially political power to a majority of the populace, but this majority of the populace belongs to the non-property classes. And that is at odds and completely incompatible with the persistence of the rule and the dominance of the property classes, which are always a minority. So only authoritarian forms of political rule or very restricted forms of Republican and democratic rule are compatible with capitalism and with class rule. Uh, that would all change in a post-capitalist society, but he was concerned with uh, the making of a democratic republic under the conditions of uh, modern capitalism. Um, according in his book, which is also uh, the, the English uh, translation of it is the uh, occasion for which we are coming together. In his book on the Austrian Revolution, we find a lot of innovations, a very uh, fresh analysis of the making and the development of a democratic republic in a capitalist society. According to Hans Kelsen, one of his major critics, he was actually uh, breaking with the tradition of Marxist political theory. And uh, well, it might look like that because he combines the analysis of institutions, whether they are constitutionally confirmed or not, with the analysis of changing balances and imbalances of uh, class uh, powers in political action. Uh, he makes some important distinctions between the state form, the form or mode of government, and he tries to show that the democratic republic, which was in the making, underwent several changes, uh, which meant that it changed also the scope of political actions for all the collective political actors involved. According to uh, Bauer, most of you will recollect that the Austrian state in the years between 1918-1920 uh, went from first a proletarian democracy, 
an aggregate state of politics uh, in a period of proletarian predominance when political action was only possible with the consent of working class organizations under the precondition of unity, political unity within the labor movement. And that established a new form of government, which he describes as functional democracy. From this, it went to the stage of a people's republic, a period of relative balance of class uh, powers between the proletariat and uh, the bourgeoisie in res respective allies, still a period of functional democracy or governance by deliberation, making consensus uh, or consent and uh, establishing compromises towards finally after the constitution had still had been achieved uh, in the period of the People's Republic towards a bourgeois republic period where the preponderance of class powers of the bourgeoisie and their allies had been restored and the mode of government uh, of functional uh, uh, democracy could be abandoned and the mode of functional oligarchy could be installed. The Republic turns into authoritarian or outright class rule. Um, all that taken together does not amount to a theory of a cycle of state or political forms, a kind of Polybian, Polybian style argument. Uh, although Bauer did not exclude the possibility uh, that the character of the Republic and the mode of government could be changed again when the balance of class powers was changed in favor of the proletarian class power. So this political analysis actually provided the basis of the strategy of uh, socialist proletarian politics in the first Republic uh, with the leading idea that the balance of class powers uh, could either prevent it to uh, decay further or even push towards the restoration of uh, more or less an equality, a balance uh, of class powers. Well, uh, the intriguing part of Bauer's analysis, in particular in the 1920s, which followed the debate, uh, the follow-up to the debates on the Austrian Revolution, was his effort to analyze a mechanism of class rule within the context of a democratic republic. Uh, how can the ruling class rule in a democratic republic when uh, Marx and many others, the liberals of the 19th century, also said this is impossible in the long run. Well, Bauer's general answer is the ruling class of modern societies, uh, the bourgeoisie rules, but it does not govern. Uh, its uh, rule depends on specific mechanisms of government, which include the making and maintaining of hegemony. And there are some core elements of this peculiar mechanism. One is the governing case. So the people who actually govern, which is made up of professionals plus intellectuals in a wide range of intellectual professions. Uh, then comes the mass parties, a new phenomenon, which had been invented actually by the socialist uh, labor movement, but was now uh, adop adopted by all the other political uh, powers that be. Uh, so mass parties were established and other political uh, organizations, including professional politicians and party officials, party bureaucracies uh, all over the place, um, which meant the, gentle, the old gentlemen's clubs of the 19th century were replaced also on the side of the bourgeoisie by um, mass uh, parties which organized not only bourgeois, but also petty bourgeois, peasants, artisans, even working class people, and were able to mobilize an electorate from different social classes. Second clue to that, this was only possible because they were able to create and to maintain hegemony, hegemony by presenting special interests of high finance, big industry, big landed property as general interests. Uh, and 
they were able to interpret private benefits for some as a precondition for the common good. And this is an ongoing proce process, reinventing this kind of narratives and this kind of interpretations of uh, uh, social interests. Uh, buttressed, of course, supported by the control of the mass media, uh, the influence, uh, influencing the mass of the non-bourgeois electorate, and control of the means of production of knowledge and the means of propagating of ideologies, making and propagating ideologies is another clue. Uh, in the end, um, Bauer sums up, so it, uh, what is established is a very specific mechanism of class rule in a democracy is a minority rule by means of a majority government of people's parties, uh, catch all parties, you could even already call them the Christian social party in Austria was an early example of that. Uh, and this is rule by means of intellectual and mental dominance by means of ideas and thought systems, which did always include bits and pieces of science. Um, <clears throat> Bauer went further to explain the crisis of democracy, in particular in the 1930s, the conflict between freedom, political freedom, the freedom of political action, equality of political rights and class rule cannot always be disguised, uh, but uh, can it continue to be contained? Uh, Bauer thought not even in the form of a bourgeois democracy where the bourgeoisie is prevailing. His answer to the obvious crisis of uh, democracy, the rise of fascist powers which openly attacked uh, all forms of parliamentary democracy uh, was, well, there are, come several crises come together, economic, social, intellectual crisis, there were two economic crises, the post-war crisis of the 1920s and the economic crisis, the great uh, second a uh, great crisis in the history of modern capitalism starting in the autumn of 1929. These undermined the broad class alliances, uh, including those that were organized by bourgeois mass parties. The uh, economic crisis also undermined the hegemony of the uh, uh, bourgeoisie. The economic crisis turns actually into a cultural intellectual crisis and the predominance of bourgeois ideas is lost, which is partly due to the fact that there are major shifts uh, in intellectual life that uh, Bauer describes as the rise of utilitarianism, relativism, today we would say uh, neoliberalism, the elements, the both elements he mentions are also present in uh, actual uh, neoliberal thought. Uh, the basis of social and economic compromise are faltering, Work and working class movements and organizations are radicalizing, and in this uh, movement of an actual crisis threatening their very existence, the ruling class will not accept a shift uh, towards a people's republic. So a new sharing of political power with proletarian parties and movements. So parts, at least parts of the bourgeoisie prefer to propel the change of the bourgeois republic into something completely different, an authoritarian non-democratic regime, a fascist regime, which Bauer uh, uh, interprets with using the analogy with Bonapartist regimes in the 19th century. Um, with the help of bourgeois, uh, non-bourgeois mass movements, uh, which the ruling class can no longer control. So it's a completely uh, different situation. Well, what is also remarkable about the political thought of the Austro-Marxist, again, in particular, uh, Otto Bauer, but this was a broad consensus among the Austro-Marxists, they were very clear in their uh, attitude towards democracy and their ideas about the socialist society and polity, which would be built upon the legacies of liberalism. 
So all the historical achievements of bourgeois class action should be preserved. In particular, Bauer is very clear on the core of liberalism uh, and democracy. In his view, it is the individual freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of political expression, uh, freedom of collective organization, the rule of law. Uh, in a post-capitalist uh, society, there will be the possibility to make use of the new elements of political democracy, which emerged, uh, as he describes it in his analysis of the Austrian revolution, uh, from the struggles during uh, the process of establishment of a democratic uh, republic, uh, the functional democracies, the deliberative democracies, the associative democracies, all these are very high uh, items high on the agenda in contemporary thought on democratic theory. Um, Otto Bauer and Max Adler and the rest of them, they all share the distinctions between political, social, economic democracy, uh, as well as the idea of a democratization process, which means establishing something like an economic democracy, unheard of, un uh, uh, wow unimaginable today, uh, but that was their idea. In the long run, there will be further and further changes in the mode of democratic government. So economic democracy means the whole fabric of democracy will change. And they part company with the exception of Max Adler who tried to preserve it uh, with respect to the infamous uh, phrase of the dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, because ba as Bauer emphasized, even the class rule of the bourgeoisie in the political form of a bourgeois republic is not a dictatorship. It is still a rule of law, although it is always fragile and can always be exploded. Um, so I want to... Uh, just wrap up uh, the Austro-Marxist legacies in political theory are extremely important. Their political thought has never been systematized, only attacked and destroyed. Uh, it is a continuation, I think the most fruitful continuation of the political thought of Marx and Engels directly in the form of historical analysis. Uh, they had Bauer, uh, Renner, Hilferding and others, they had the enormous uh, advantage of a real experience with the working of a parliamentary democracy on the base of universal suffrage and with considerable political weight, political impact of the working class organizations. Otto Bauer shared the experience with all the others, or so the Austromaxists, uh, in their uh, totality were engaged in the great experiment of the re of Red Vienna. And they had the experience that it was possible to change the way of life of proletarian population in an urban context, more or less by more or less radical means and against many odds. And actually how one could build hegemony and mass support again against many odds within this context. So the idea of conquering a share, even a strong foothold in the fabric of political power uh, is not an illusion in their view, but a possibility within the framework of a democratic republic. Okay. Uh, I hope I have not extended extremely my time. Uh, this was what I wanted to highlight from the political uh, uh, thought and contribution to the political thought in the Marxist tradition by the Austro-Marxists, which is in my view, the major alternative to, Len to Leninist, Trotskyist uh, political thought until this very day. Okay, thank you very much for your patience and uh, attention. I stop here and unfortunately I cannot hear you. And I stop the share. Okay, fine.
You cannot hear me? You cannot hear me? Okay, I'm sorry for uh, try to sort it out again for this afternoon. Yes, fine, that's okay. Uh, uh, Yes, so uh, this is also a first time for me to to moderate such a such a very funny uh, funny uh, hybrid conference. So <laughs> actually, okay, I'm also trying my best. Uh, well, good. Uh, I would like, yeah, if somebody would like to, somebody has a question, please uh, just ask the question in your microphone, and uh, Barbara will transcribe your question to. Mihail, and then uh, hopefully he will answer. Take a micro. If you, if it doesn't work, you can have this one. Yeah, I, I hope it works. Uh, thank you very much, Mikhail, for a very interesting presentation. I have a, a couple of questions and comments, uh, I guess starting chronologically. Uh, I would say that uh, Austria-Hungary did in fact have a colony and it was Bosnia. And I think that's kind of a uh, you know, blind spot also of Austro-Marxist theory that tells us of some of their limitations. So I would, you know, I would you like to, to hear you Much reflect slower, on. much slower. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so please introduce I, yourself. And you have okay. to talk much slower. <laughs> Uh, so my name is uh, Stefan Gushvitsa. I'm a doctoral student from the University of Regensburg. And um, uh, first I wanted to say that Austria-Hungary did in fact have a colony in Bosnia. And that, that, that's something that, uh, uh, that uh, the Austro-Marxists also kind of ignored and were, you know, at the very best apologetic of. So, you know, I would like to hear you reflect on that as a blind spot of Austro-Marxist uh, uh, theory. Uh, then uh, I found this distinction uh, in, that you talked about very interesting, the proletarian democracy, then people's republic, then bourgeois republic. Uh, but I think it's, it's also very, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, Bauer then speaks of republic when you have a people's republic and the bourgeois republic, but of democracy when he speaks of proletarian democracy. So if you could elaborate a bit on that a bit more. So what are the different meanings of democracy and republic for him? Um, and the final one would be uh, related to sort of the concluding more remarks. Words, please. I have to finish the first question okay. still. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to see also. Next question. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, so th this question, yeah, I want to see why, uh, why in this uh, triple model, uh, Bauer distinguishes between democracy and republic. You know, why do we speak of a proletarian democracy, but of a bourgeois republic? I think that's very interesting. Okay, I see. Shall I respond immediately? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, in the Austrian, in, in, in the uh, study of the nationality uh, question, of course, uh, the um, 
and the Balkan countries and the expansion, the long-term expansion of the Austro-Hungarian Empire into the Balkans, actually uh, the long history of the struggle with the Ottoman Empire is a topic, of course it is. And you might say that uh, Bosnia, which was uh, very lately, uh, well, um, yeah, you cannot even say conquered. It, it became part of the Austrian Empire, breaking also international treaties, quite complicated story. You might say that this was a colony, but it was still regarded also by the, uh, by the other European powers as part of Europe. So more or less uh, 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 not a conquest or not a colony in the usual sense. Um, well, of course, one could compare it with the colony of Ireland, actually the oldest colony within the European context. Uh, and from the British point of view, the Irish were always a primitive, backward people, uh, inferior people. So it has the, the occupation and the, the British rule in Ireland has all the uh, co common features of uh, colonization and colonial rule. I'm not sure whether this was exactly the same in Bosnia. Uh, so I, I, I doubt it, but uh, you're certainly right, one should look into it. Uh, the major point is that Aust the Austrian-Hungarian Empire was not at a par with the other empires of the time, uh, with Tsarist Russia, uh, with the British Empire, with the French Empire, even with the German Empire, which tried to expand and to build up a colonial empire of its own. So as a naval power, it was very small. And there were not, no actual plans to, to expand worldwide, although it had been discussed, of course. Uh, so, to a certain degree, the Austrian-Hungarian uh, Empire stayed confined within the European context and was quite happy to do so. Uh, so, the, the, the major aspects uh, the Austro-Marxists were interested in was the inner fragility of this uh, still great power. Uh, and the, the its, its chances to survive, and the integration of Bosnia would be only be a part of it. So not more difficult, not very different from the integration of Ukrainians or Polish-speaking people uh, in Galicia and in, in, in Ruthenia, etc. Um, apart from it, the 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 big. Uh, divide between the Austrian and the Hungarian part. This was all a very fragile uh, construction. And so they, they asked themselves whether this would break apart as contemporary political theorists said. Uh, so in particular, the votaries of the nation state, Austria-Hungary is an unnatural construction, so uh, it should and it will inevitably fall apart into nation states because this is a modern cause of action and they were contemporaries or they were still under the impact of the Italian unification, of the German unification, so building uh, uh, nation states, which then became empires, even the Italian nation state tried to establish a colonial empire and to become part of the club of the big guys in, in, in the greater powers. Uh, that was regarded by many as a normal course of action. And now Renan and Bauer tried to find out whether uh, Austria-Hungary could survive as a multinational state. And of course they wanted big changes. So the whole, the, all their nationality policy is about establishing or uh, pushing forward changes uh, which would allow uh, large scale autonomy for the different nationalities. And in this way, some kind of new uh, compromise a new uh, a new mode of life for uh, the the Austrian-Hungarian state. Um, 
Well, uh, Bauer, on, on democracy, uh, the, the difference between uh, democracy and republic is quite simple. You can have a republic, so a non-monarchist uh, uh, state form um, without full democracy. So with restricted forms of uh, uh, democracy, a liberal state would normally not necessarily be a republic, uh, look at the famous example of the British Empire. The British state still today is not a republic, although there is a kind of uh, democracy has been established. You can even have democracy without a republic. Uh, Bauer thought of the combination of both. It was quite clear uh, after the war, after actually the decay of the uh, Austrian-Hungarian army, which was the central uh, uh, element that held the uh, state together. It was, and after the application of the, the last emperor, it was quite clear that uh, Austria would not uh, continue and that it would fall apart, uh, although they didn't like it. Uh, Bauer and Renner were, as you probably all know, very much in favor of uh, uniting the uh, German-speaking parts of Austria with the uh, greater German Empire, which did not happen because of a lot of resistance to this from, from the other great powers. Anyway, it would be a republic and it should be a democratic republic. Uh, and in terms of democracy, they had very clear ideas which followed the lead of liberalism. It's not by chance that uh, Renner and Bauer both um, tried their utmost best to win over Hans Kelsen as author of the Constitution of the First Republic. They were very much uh, convinced that there is no democracy without universal suffrage uh, <coughs> with all the necessary applications. Uh, Austria actually immediately had uh, female su uh, suffrage, uh, un really un universal suffrage, which would change a lot. Uh, they were very clear that uh, democracy needed self-government on a local and regional level. They were even in favor of a federal structure. So uh, the basic elements of what is still today regarded as uh, fundamental for democratic political form are all there in their political thought. Well, the, the major innovation is that they think of democracy as a very flexible political form. They were against uh, council, not against council democracy, but against uh, building the new state uh, ex exclusively upon uh, workers' councils as they existed in the tradition period. This is a major conflict also in other parts of Europe in, at this time. Uh, their decision is quite clear. They tried to establish, and they actually did, uh, a, a core piece of uh, economic democracy within the economy uh, by legalizing uh, workers' representations in, well, a part at least of the, um, um, of the private economy. And uh, they wanted to establish uh, self-government on the local and regional uh, level, which also worked. And they were very much in favor of uh, not only establishing, but using to its full extent, all the rights and political freedoms that a political democracy brought with them, because they thought this would also be a part of the future uh, uh, political form, as long as there still would be a political form of a post-capitalist society. Okay. I tried to answer as far as I could. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, uh, does anyone, we have, uh, we have 10 minutes left for, for discussion. Uh, does anyone has uh, another question for Michal? Yes, please. So I'm Attila Antal, I'm from Budapest. I'm assistant lecturer at Alta University. And thank you for this very important and beautiful lecture. Uh, I would like to put an emphasis on Karl Polanyi because it uh, was a very, very uh, intimate relationship, scientific intimate relationship between Polanyi and Bauer. Uh, it, is, it has been investigated that, for instance, the functional uh, democracy theory of uh, Bauer was uh, uh, appreciated by Karl Polanyi. What do you think about that? What is the uh, impact of Austro Marxism on uh, Karplani masterpiece, the Great uh, Transformation. So, who uh, did the Austro Marxist uh, circles and uh, theories impacted uh, Karplani work and the Great uh, Transformation? Thank you for that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is certainly an uh, important intellectual relationship. Um, as well, you're certainly aware that uh, Karl Polanyi at that time was in Vienna. He was participating also in the debate on uh, socialist democracy, uh, socialist planning, etc. Uh, this is a topic I did not even broach uh, <clears throat> during the period of the Austrian Revolution. Uh, Bauer was a political actor of an enormous importance in particular because he's one of the very, very few figures. There are others in Germany uh, too and in other countries who actually had a plan, a clear concept for a transition towards socialism. Uh, and he propagated in, it in various ways. So he was actually intervening quite often in the debate about, well, what should we do now when we are very close or actually are in the position of power and predominance? Um, Bauer is the one who defends until the very end that he had avoided uh, what he regarded together with the others as probably, possibly, uh, a bloody catastrophe of a Vienna Commune, so taking power when it was possible. They refused to do it, and you know there were bloody clashes with the Communist Party uh, who saw this completely otherwise. Well, I'm quite sure that uh, Polanyi read all what Bauer uh, published at that time quite carefully, and he intervened into the um, uh, debate on uh, uh, the basics of a socialist order, socialist economic order. Uh, there is certainly also an influence uh, from uh, Bauer thought uh, in terms of imagining the making of modern capitalism as a long trajectory with a lot of uh, movements and counter movements. Uh, that was around. So Polanyi, if you put him in his context, uh, although he wrote this many years later, he wrote The Great Transformation many years later when in exile in, in Great Britain and then in the US. Uh, but he was strongly influenced by this uh, whole uh, strand of thought uh, where you see the development of capitalism as a long trajectory uh, marked by different political compromises and political changes, big changes. So it's in, in the presentation and the analysis of that in particular Bauer presented, it's never purely uh, the logic of an economic development. It's always a highly complicated uh, matter of uh, uh, political and social and cultural and intellectual changes. Uh, so these people were strongly influenced also by the founding fathers of the uh, social sciences of their time, by Max Weber, uh, by, by Simmel, by uh, Ferdinand Tannis, who 
in that, for their part, also were strongly influenced by Marx. So this is a quite open uh, uh, situation, open debate. I'm not aware of any personal contacts between Karl Polanyi and, and Otto Bauer. He certainly had contact with some of the austro Marxists. That was inevitable. And they uh, knew of his uh, contributions as an economic journalist. So uh, they were aware of each other probably, but Karl Polanyi was not really uh, a celebrity at that time. And he was not, apart from some interventions in the debate on socialism and uh, the, the famous calculation debate, uh, he was not a very prominent figure at that time. Uh, well, one should look again into it, but I'm quite sure that, uh, and that was certainly also the reason for his wife, for Il Ilona Dushinska, that he took, she took issue with him and tried to uh, re-educate her husband, uh, because she was a uh, very, uh, well, um, even wild critic of uh, the Austro-Marxist uh, policies of the 1920s and 30s. Um, and she, she tried to, if you like, uh, redress his mind and to tell him among other things, uh, how wrong he was in his appreci appreciation of the Austro-Marxist contributions to political theory and to political economy. I, I'm not sure that she really succeeded in this enterprise, but it's clear that uh, uh, Polanyi was uh, influenced in many ways by the, uh, not only by the whole cultural environment of Vienna uh, in the 1920s, uh, but certainly by Austro-Marxist thought. You, you find elements of that in the uh, great transformation. Um, it, it's also clear that uh, Polanyi had some, um, well, reservations about the Marxist political, uh, Marxist economic theory. Um, and he sometimes misreads it completely, but uh, that's not, not really the most important. Uh, um, criticism you can have against him. Uh, so I wouldn't say it is a work of Austro-Marxism, but uh, it is uh, uh, certainly influenced a great transformation and his further thought uh, on political economy is certainly strongly influenced by uh, the Austro-Marxist environment. Okay. Okay, I see, I see, I see, I see. Contribution, we would have yes. uh, other questions, but we are the, uh, uh, off time. National question. Well, uh, there, there are, and, and you're, you're referring to the Jewish uh, labor movement and to the publications. There, there are many of them still exist. Um, I, I know that there have been relations between the Bundists, so the, the Jewish uh, labor party in Eastern Europe, uh, the Bund uh, and the Austrian social democracy, of course there have been, and leading intellectuals uh, from this movement have been, had been in Vienna. Uh, a lot of uh, Adler's and Bauer's writings have been translated into Yiddish and so used as even, well, materials for the educational work of the uh, Bund, of the Jewish labor movement. So there certainly was an influence. Bauer himself, although of Jewish uh, origin, as several of the Austro-Marxist intellectuals were, uh, was not really uh, an, um, well active in one way or the other. Uh, he did not really uh, engage with the Zionist movement, Zionist thought. He is very aware of the Jewish question, 
So maybe this is not very well known, but his very his latest article, uh, just before he died in 1938, is about uh, the uh, uh, at that time it was not yet a genocide, but it started to become a very massive suppression and uh, actually a uh, well, massive state action, you could even say state terrorism against the Jews uh, in, in the Jewish population in Germany and of course in Austria, which had been, well, uh, um, had become part of the Nazi empire uh, in, in 1938. And his very last article is, uh, written for the uh, international uh, socialist movement and trying to make them uh, aware of this uh, uh, very imminent danger, uh, which went bef beyond pure suppression of a state organized mass scale program. He, he couldn't imagine the, the, the kind of genocide which was going to come. Uh, so you can say there is an engagement with the Jewish labor movement. You can also say that there are exchanges with the leading intellectuals in the Bundish, uh, in, in the Bund. Um, uh, but as far as I remember, Bauer did not really treat the Jews as a nation. He's very cautious about that. Uh, he didn't see it like that. And uh, he did, as far as I recall, never really speak out against or in favor of a Zionist, uh, of, of, of Zionism in one way or the other. As you know, there was also a very broad socialist or left strand of Zionism, uh, which has influenced the early migration to, towards uh, Palestine for, for many years. As far as I know, Bauer was not very much uh, engaged with that. And he didn't regard the, the Jews as, a, as one of the nations of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Uh, there is no uh, longer reflection upon the Jewish question as it was uh, called in the, at that time in his work, at least as far as I recall. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think Michael is is absolutely right in uh, okay, describing. Okay, thank you very much. I will try to fix <laughs> the uh, the is audio problem. Yeah, he's describing. <laughs> Uh, very correctly, uh, the ambivalent uh, attitude of uh, Otto Bauer towards the Jewish question, which is quite strange, because on the one side, he solidar solidarized himself with the Jewish communities vis-a-vis -vis the repressions. He paid, for example, the fee for the community in Vienna in order to demonstrate his sensitivity towards this. And at the same time, he definitely, and I would even say polemically, uh, rejects rejects the idea of a Jewish nation, which is also strange given the large Jewish communities in Galicia and in other parts of, uh, of the empire.